A couple of months ago, I had a conversation with Birchie. Birchie's a pioneer in the solar industry and the CEO of Open Solar, a company trying to facilitate solar power delivery all around the world. Birchie was a really exciting person for me to meet and to talk to. And he mentioned the modeling that he's been doing linked to the growth of solar power all around the world. And based on that modeling, what we might see if growth continues at a similar rate to the last decade or so. Birchie's model suggests that in the next 10 years, 50% of all energy globally will be generated using solar power from about 3% today, according to data from our world and data. Birchie's assessment is that if solar continues to grow at a similar rate to what we've had over the last 10 years, and that if electrification of our economy occurs at a similar rate to what it has in the last 10 years, then the math says that 50% of energy can be generated by solar. And just before we get into it for a moment, let's just consider what this means. 50% of all energy, not just the 50% of the electricity that we use today for powering our lives, our homes, workplaces and industry, 50% of all energy, most of which is delivered today by fossil fuels. So this seems to me like an absurd suggestion. We are miles and miles away from that. But Birchie's modeling seems to stand up and whether it's 50% of energy is generated from solar power in 2035 or whether it would be 30% or 70%, what he's doing is he's naming a revolution in our energy systems that we will experience in the short term. So I spent a short amount of time trying to analyze high level data uh, to see what I, to see what figure I would get based on a data set from our world and data about solar power. And I see something similar. On average, over the last 10 years, solar's share of primary energy has grown by 24% year on year. And if this continued, and if other energy sources stayed the same, which might not be likely, but bear with me, but we would see solar power being 30% of primary energy by 2035, which is interesting. And what's the famous quote, that all models are wrong, but some are useful? Well, we'll see over the next 10 years whether this model is wrong or right. But if this revolution is going to happen, then surely we should be seeing the first fruits of it today. And if you look closely, this is exactly what we are beginning to see. And there are a few data sets that are starting to show signs of this revolution. So first, let's have a look at some data published by Ember, a global energy think tank, data that's about solar all around the world. And before we get into that, if you find this video at all interesting, I'd be thrilled if you hit the subscribe button for more of the same this autumn. But let's look at the data and let's start in Africa. It's not somewhere that we tend to hear much about when we're talking about the energy transition. But in the last 12 months, solar panel imports to Africa rose by 60% to over 15 gigawatts of solar capacity, with the spread of solar being imported across the whole con continent. Ember says that 20 countries hit import records in the last 12 months and 25 countries imported over 100 megawatts of solar. And this could be because generating electricity with solar panels is significantly cheaper than generating using diesel generators. With Ember saying that import costs for refined oil being between 30 and 107 times more than solar. So Ember suggests that the imports are likely to be going into distributed solar power rather than big utility scale solar. So small systems di distributed to where they are needed without major grid infrastructure uh, upgrades and costs. And when you look at Ember's graphs of solar imports around the continent, I start to wonder what could be. This, this, let's look at a few countries. So first of all, Algeria going from almost zero imports to over one gigawatts. Congo and Mozambique over 300 megawatts. Kenya, 500 megawatts. Nigeria over 1.5 gigawatts. Sudan, Tanzania, Zambia, over 400 megawatts. This level of additional solar capacity going into loads of countries would be much more than just a blip, with one part of Ember's analysis, analysis suggesting that the theoretical generation from this import, uh, this capacity of panels uh, that's gone into these, these countries in the last 12 months would add over 5% to total generation uh, in 16 African countries or as high as adding 60% for Sierra Leone. So the growth in Africa is exciting and it's interesting, but the numbers are actually still quite small for the whole continent compared to much of the rest of the world. 
And the suggestion from Ember is that this could just be the start for Africa, the start of something really transformational. And that it could be following in the footsteps of some places that are a little bit further ahead, places like Pakistan. Last year, last year we, we had reporting in a few different places about the, the huge quantity of solar panels that had been imported to Pakistan. Lots of these solar panels didn't seem to register on the Pakistani grid, but again, we're likely to, to be installed in a distributed manner, so small systems installed at homes or farms or in remote locations. And the imports from last year into Pakistan appear to be continuing this year, with over 15 gigawatts imported in 2024 and nearly 20 gigawatts in the 12 months to May 2025. These are significant numbers that will be having a significant impact on the world's fifth biggest country. One estimate suggested that, that one third of Pakistan's entire generation capacity was added in 2024 alone. And we see this in some more data. So the reduction in CO2 intensity of Pakistani elect electricity between 2023 and 2024 was nearly 7%. And with the solar imports continuing in 2025, I wonder what the CO2 intensity impact will be for this year. One of the comments that we hear a little bit in the discussion around the global low carbon transition is that many developing countries are likely to skip fossil fuel energy as they grow and jump, jump straight into distributed renewables. In a similar way to, to the way that countries skipped the rollout of telephone landlines and jumped straight to mobile phones. And the imports of solar panels to, to the continent of Africa and to countries like Pakistan are hinting at this happening already. And it'll be really interesting to watch in the next few years what that will result in. It could mean that countries are developing without using oil and gas to do so, which would mean a significant amount of avoided emissions. Okay, so that's Africa and that's Pakistan. What's happening in the rest of the world? Back in May, Ember reported on China's progress on the solar rollout. So as well as manufacturing 80% of the solar panels used all around the world, China had record-breaking additions of both solar and wind capacity in 2024 locally in China. So 278 gigawatts of solar, 79.8 gigawatts of wind. And these are massive numbers. China's solar capacity is now over 1.1 terawatts as of May this year. On a heavy day of usage in the UK, our grid might supply 45 gigawatts. So solar capacity alone in China could supply our highest demand nearly 25 times. And this capacity is leading to as much solar generation for China in the first three months of this year than the whole of 2020, with the, gr the growth in clean power helping to drive down coal generation in China from over 70% of total generation a decade ago to less than 55% last year. So the continued rollout of solar uh, and the news of record-breaking wind turbine capacity China's coal use looks likely to fall and fall. And we regularly hear people, uh, from people saying that China is opening a new coal power station every week. That may be true, but if the share of generation that coal is responsible for is dropping, then new coal power stations aren't as important or as bad as they might appear. Another one of Ember's studies is a little bit more nuanced, but it's about the economics of solar power. Ember states that the cost for solar plus storage, so batteries, around the world now means that solar can supply electricity in sunny parts of the world for lower costs than coal and nuclear, with panels charging battery storage to provide 24 seven supply. Their study suggests that for a city like Las Vegas, the cheapest way to power its activities would, would be solar plus storage for 97% of the time. Even in the, UK, in the UK, it suggests that solar plus storage would be the cheapest over 60% of the time and Johannesburg 95% of the time. It took me a couple of seconds to work out what this meant, but my conclusion is that the latest cost figures on solar and storage now mean that the majority of the world could be powered using solar and storage more cheaply than any other power source for the majority of the time. And it's those kind of economic figures that are driving Birchie's S-curve model. Get into cost parity with other generation technologies and then surpassing it gives the opportunity for solar to grow and grow and grow. Not to tackle climate change, not just to tackle climate change, but also to reduce costs. In Europe, there is another good news story where in June this year, solar had the largest share of electricity generation for the whole month at 22.1%, which is more than nuclear power at 21.8%, wind power at 15.8%, gas at 14.4%, 
Solar in the EU generated 45.4 terawatt hours in June. Alongside record wind generation in May and June, 2025 looks like it's a significant year for low carbon electricity around the continent. But does that really mean that we're reducing emissions? Well, yeah, I think it could do because the record solar and wind push coal generation down to its lowest share of total generation in decades, making it only 6.1% of electricity in the continent in June. Solar across Europe is helping to drive down fossil fuel use and will be having a significant impact on European emissions. And even in the USA, solar power generated 32% more this July than last and 60% more than the year before. In 2020, solar generated 131 terawatt hours in the United States for the whole year. In 2024, 303 terawatt hours. On average, since 2018, solar growth in the USA has been nearly 22% quicker than in Europe where growth has been 17% year on year. So Mr. Trump may be able to slow that down, but he may not. It looks like the solar train has come to the USA too. And then what about closer to home? What about the UK, our cloudy, rainy island? Surely this is a story for everywhere but here, isn't it? Well, data up to the end of August, solar has had a record breaking year in the UK, up almost a third at 10 terawatt hours of generation including records in five months in a row since March, and a highest ever solar generation of 14 gigawatts on the 8th of July this year. Much of this has, is because it's been quite a sunny year. It's been a great summer, but installations of solar on roofs of homes and businesses on, and on low grade farmland means that we're taking advantage of the sunny year to generate low cost and low emissions power, which is fantastic. And it looks like this will continue to grow in the UK over the next five to 10 years, with solar power being some of the cheapest ways to generate electricity in the UK. And although the data says that we burnt more gas in winter this year than last, in the spring and summer, this dropped dramatically with a 25% drop year on year of gas generation in May and 21% drop in June. Wind and solar is displacing the gas that we might have burnt for power in the past. And then from a domestic perspective, installations of roof mounted home solar systems are still growing with the size of installations higher than they have been over the last 10 years. So data from the micro generation certification scheme shows this quite clearly. As of the end of August, there were over 157,000 MCS accredited PV systems installed this year. If we install a similar rate for the rest of the year, we would see a total of around 235,000 for the year compared to a total of 195,000 last year. And that, that's basically a 20% increase year on year. And by far the highest number of installations since, since the end of the feed-in tariff nearly a decade ago. The 23,870 installed systems in March this year was the biggest in a month since December 2015. And in terms of size, 50% of systems are now between four and 10 kilowatts. When in 2015, this figure was only 5%. So we're installing the most systems as we have in the last decade, and we're installing bigger systems at homes than we have done before. And it looks like we won't stop there. The future home standard that will come into effect by the end of the year will require new homes to have panels as standard. So we will see hundreds of thousands of new homes built each year with solar on their roofs. So 2025 may well be setting records for solar generation in the UK, but with commercial ground mounted systems being constructed across the country and roof mounted commercial and domestic systems getting stronger and stronger, I wouldn't bet against 2026 beating this year too. Some of those arguing against the transition in the UK would suggest that the sun doesn't always shine here. And that's absolutely true. And Ember have produced some analysis to back that up. But their analysis suggests that it's quite rare to have a day without both sun and wind. The sun doesn't always shine, but when it isn't shining, it is often windy. Ember estimates just 2% of days throughout an average UK year would be both low wind and low sun, with dark winters often seeing windier weather and bright summers often seeing sunny weather. You can start to see how a clean system would get us nearly the whole way to a very low emissions electricity grid in the UK. So overall around the world, we are seeing solar growing much more quickly than any other generation technology. And it looks like this will continue to grow if, if not see growth accelerate and accelerate. 
Ember says it took eight years to get from two, from 100 terawatt hours of generation per year from solar to 1,000 terawatt hours, and then only three years to get from 1,000 to 2,000. If you compare year on year, we can see an average 27% increase in generation each year for the last 10 years. At what point could we begin to use that word exponential? At least it does look like the rapid growth in the center of Birchie's S-curve. The acceleration of solar deployment and the generation of that solar is really amazing. It appears that the revolution that we see in Birchie's S-curve really may well be happening. An installation of solar around the world is going to be doing the supply side of the story, but to meet Birchie's prediction of 50% of all energy supplied by solar, we need to see a similar revolution on the demand side. So electrifying our transport, whether cars, lorries, trains, buses, even boats, that can reduce the energy needed and can take advantage of the waves and waves of clean, cheap electricity generated by solar panels powered by the sun. Similarly, electrifying industry and processes that rely on fossil fuels could help reduce costs for industry around the world. An installation of heat pumps that could provide summer cooling alongside winter heating could help electrify much of the built environment. Although imperfectly coupled with solar, we do see the diversity of generation in the UK that can help power heat pumps in winter. So I conclude uh, this video with a few things. First of all, I think the data compiled by Ember is fantastic. It's interesting, it's exciting and it's helpful. It helps us understand what is happening in this rapid transition all around the world. Second thing I conclude is that the rollout of solar around the world is pretty amazing. With that reduction in solar costs driving an acceleration of solar deployment even in developing countries where we've not seen it in the past. This will impact the amount of fossil fuels burnt around the world and it will impact the quantity of CO2 emissions that we see, particularly linked to electricity. The next conclusion is that it appears that Birchie's predictions and analysis won't be too far away from reality. Next, it appears to me that the solar train really is coming and there won't be much that can be done to stop it. But the final conclusion really is that all this reminds me that we cannot solar panel our way out of this problem that solar generation alone is only one part of the story and electrification of the demand side is essential to take advantage of this cheap generation. Electrification of transport, industry and heat are some of the biggest challenges that we still have that solar can support but, they, but it can't solve. So I see these stats and I am hopeful. But I also see these stats and I remember that 85%, more than 85% of primary energy in the UK is delivered by fossil fuels today. And I remember the work that still needs to be done. So let's celebrate growth in solar power around the world and let's continue to work to stop burning stuff as quickly as possible. What do you think? Does data like the stuff published by Ember give you hope or don't you believe the hype? I would love to hear what you think. And if you've got this far, but you don't subscribe to my channel, like 94% of people watching my videos in the last year, I would be thrilled if you clicked that button and came along for the ride. And if you're one of those people that does subscribe already, I would be really encouraged if you'd look at the memberships page and considered joining the channel. Thanks and that's all for this week.